You're listening to Archeo Ed, a podcast about the ancient civilizations of the Americas. I'm your host, Ed Barnhart. I've been an archeologist, an explorer, and a seeker of esoteric knowledge all over the Americas for 30 years and counting. This podcast is just me, no guests to help me fill the airtime. Sometimes I'll teach you about the many civilizations of the Americas long before Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Other times, I'll tell stories of my adventures in the field. It's just me, freed from the podium and talking like we're just having a beer together. If that sounds good to you, then sit back, relax, and let me tell you a tale. Hey, archaeology fans. Welcome to Season 6 of ArcheoEd. Based mostly on your suggestions, this year I plan to cover the ancient Amazon, the Caribbean, and the origins of Aztec civilization. But I've also received a lot of positive feedback about my adventure stories from the field. So, I decided to start Season 6 by continuing the story of the Palenque Mapping Project. As I promised back in Season 4, I'll tell the tale Star Wars style, in three trilogies, one for each year of the Palenque Mapping Project. And, just like Star Wars, no promises on a schedule, or even that I'll release them in a logical order. Year 2 of the project will be covered in Parts 4, 5, and 6. This is Part 4 the start of the 1999 field season. The second season got off to a slow start. January 1999 passed with me still busily planning away in Austin, Texas. FAMSI had approved my grant for season two, but I still had more plans than money. My field journal from the time is full of grant proposals and budget estimates. I wanted to hire more people commission more reconstruction drawings, and obtain new satellite imagery of the area. Google Earth hadn't been invented yet, so I was reaching out to private firms and the U.S. government about how to obtain satellite imagery. I even asked Sovin Form Spudnik, the Russian government satellite imagery outfit. But it was all too expensive for my budget. I wrote a National Science Foundation grant request for more money, but it was denied. The other big ticket item the project needed was our own laser theodolite equipment. We had used Alfonso's laser theodolite for season one, but it was a donation from Dick Bistrup, and he really didn't want me using it. It was also old and slow. I called dozens of survey firms, asking them to donate the rental of the equipment to my project, but couldn't get a single one to do it. The most common response was, you want to take our machine to Mexico? No way. So I thought, heck, I'll ask the manufacturers themselves. Bistrup's machine was made by Topcon, and I already knew how to use that, so I called them. I called their dealerships around the country, getting much the same response as I got from the survey firms. But then a guy in California's corporate headquarters named Peter Wallace said, Palenque? I know that place. Supporting your work would be great PR for us. For just the price of insuring it, he lent us the -the top-of-the-line Topcon laser theodolate for two years. I was ready to take anything at that point. But now we had the best. The machine he lent us retailed at $15,000. When I called to give it back two years later, Peter had left the company. I never got to thank him properly, but Peter, if you're out there listening, thank you. The Palenque Mapping Project couldn't have happened without you. The crew for the 1999 field season was more or less set. Barry Nallen and Steve Seamer would each give us a month. Kirk French, still a student at what's now Texas State University, would come down all summer. Jim Eckhart was the only one who agreed to work with me for the entire season. Regarding Jim, let me take a moment to set the record straight. I was listening to my podcast episodes about season one and noted how many times I mentioned him being sick or embarrassing things that happened to him. We're good friends, 
and have that kind of make fun of each other relationship. But make no mistake, Jim is a hero. Since the days when we discovered Mashna together, Jim has always been there for me. And our partnership remains strong to this day. I can't talk about it just yet, but we're doing a darn cool project right now. In mid-February, Jim took a bus from Kansas to Austin. He and I packed up my yellow Toyota station wagon and headed south. Chato Morales was building our new field house in El Panchan, so we packed the car with household items, everything from a microwave to bed linens. We knew it would be a pain to cross the border. You had to present an inventory list of everything in your vehicle, and the immigration officers could charge you whatever they wanted. On the first day, we just drove to the Texas border and spent the night in Brownsville. If we crossed at 6 a.m., a day's driving would get us to Poza Rica, Veracruz. One more full day would get us to Palenque by nightfall. Hitting the border at 6 a.m. worked great. The sleepy immigration officers waved us through with a minimum of hassle. But as we drove south, bad roads hampered our progress. By the time we reached the petroleum port city of Tampico, we were hours behind schedule. The sun was setting, and I tried really hard to avoid driving at night, but Poza Rica was still hours away. Jim was driving on the feeder loop around the city. Just as we were crossing a long, curving bridge, the traffic opened up a bit. Near the end of the bridge, Jim decided to pass a big truck. A Mexican cop car was coming from the other direction. To avoid us, he had to bail off the road and go under the bridge. I said, oh crap, we just ran a cop off the road. We are going to Mexican jail. Sure enough, he flipped around and put his lights on. Jim stopped on the roadside and he pulled up behind us. Jim spoke no Spanish, and mine was pretty bad at the time, but I got out to meet the approaching cop. He started off by threatening to arrest us and impound the car. I replied with profuse apologies and that we were archaeologists working for his government, that we couldn't stop because very important government officials were waiting for us in Palenque. He then said, at minimum, we would have to pay a big fine. I thought, here it is. This is when I bribe him to let us go. So I said, great. Can I pay you now? But that's not how the bribe game works. So he was offended. He said, of course not. You have to go to the Tampico police station and pay your fine. I replied that we couldn't do that because we still had a long way to go that night. Couldn't he just help me? Then he started talking around the bribe. That's the game. You never say it outright. But honestly, I was so scared that I couldn't understand what he was saying. Finally, he got frustrated and said, just offer me something. Again, I thought, here we go. I thought it was going to be a negotiation. So I started by lowballing him. I said, 50 pesos? And to my shock, he said okay. I gave him 50 pesos and got back in the car where Jim was sitting looking white as a sheet. I said, drive. He said, what happened? I replied, we just paid a cop $5 for running him off the road. Now drive before he changes his mind. And we did. We made it to Poza Rica and took the next day off to visit the nearby ruins of El Tajin. We were a little shaken, so we just took the day off. By mid-afternoon the next day, we arrived to Palenque. I'll take my first commercial break right here, and when I return, we'll talk about the surprises waiting for us in Palenque. My family has a fluffy little dog named Mr. Darcy. Truth be told, he's a bit of a nervous Nelly. We're always looking for new ways to soothe his anxiety. And recently, our beloved old dog, Dasher, passed away. It was so hard to watch his joint pain increase. We tried everything to help him, but eventually it got to be too much. But in today's world, we now have CBD-based supplements to help our pets through tough times. Evergreen Natural Pet is a great choice for those supplements. 
all of their products are third-party tested. They have dog biscuits and extracts with little droppers so you can just drip a few drops onto their supper. They won't even know it's there. Perfect for picky little dogs like Mr. Darcy. All of their products are made with a special blend of supplements to support your pet's best life. They have Canna Chill for calming support, Canna Mobility for joint support, Canna Omega-3 with salmon oil for skin and coat support, and Canna Immunity with a blend of medicinal mushrooms to support your pet's immune system. Is your family pet a horse? Evergreen Natural Pet also offers Canna Equine for horses. Go to evergreennaturalpet.com for more information and use the code MAYA, M-A-Y-A, to get 10% off your order today. Tell them Archeo Ed sent you. Hey folks, I hope that most of you know that, apart from Archeo Ed, I'm also the director of Maya Exploration Center. For 20 years now, we've been conducting archaeological research, delivering public lectures, and leading educational travel programs. For 2025, new archaeologists have joined our team, and they'll be leading brand new educational travel tours. We're headed to Mesoamerica, Peru, Greece, Wales, and even Cambodia. Our trips are all led by scholars and include evening lectures. All levels of knowledge are welcome. Our goal is to educate in fun ways and exciting settings. To learn more and consider joining one of our adventures, go to mayaexploration.org. That's M-A-Y-A exploration dot O-R-G. When we arrived to Palenque in late February, Chato explained that he wasn't done building our house in Panchan yet. Luckily, Alfonso let us live in his house in town for the first week. The house was almost done. It just needed things like doors, windows, toilets, and the kitchen. I also had to buy all the furniture. So Jim and I occupied ourselves with that task for the first week. Once I bought the beds, we camped out in the house as Chato's guys built it around us. We had lots of requested items to deliver as well. Chris Powell needed auto parts. Our new neighbor Kathy Kahn wanted a used VCR. And our machete crew all wanted wristwatches. Our new place in Panchan, even incomplete, was awesome. It was surrounded in jungle on all sides with a kitchen, living room, my bedroom, and a bathroom on the top floor. The bottom floor had two bedrooms, two bathrooms, and a little office for our computer work and library. One of our first nights there, Sister Shelly Morales ran by our house yelling, Indios! Jim and I looked at each other and said, Indians? Is she saying that we're under Indian attack? Then, Moises Morales and his third-born son, Beto, ran by our house with guns. We stood there on our porch, waiting for the shots to ring out, but none came. Moy returned after a while and said that the Maya people from a nearby village were trying to squat on the land. He and Beto had run them off. We quickly learned that while Indios weren't invading, other things were, namely bugs and animals. I brought a bird feeder down with seed I bought in a Texas grocery store. I was looking forward to all of the tropical birds it would attract and hung it up outside of our front window. When I woke the next morning to see if it was working, it was full of ants from top to bottom. Undaunted, we dumped it out and Jim and I hung a rope between two trees outside the same window. We filled it up again and hung it out in the middle of that rope. The next morning, I looked out just in time to see a howler monkey hanging from the rope with one hand and deftly unhooking my bird feeder with the other. He swung into the forest with it, and that was the last I ever saw of it. So much for bird feeders in Chiapas. The best part of living in Panchan was Chato's new restaurant, Don Mucho's. 
Chato was quite honest with me that he took the money I had sent down to build the house and instead used it to build Don Mucho's. He said, don't worry, it's making a bunch of money and I'm using that to build your house. You can have free meals there until I finish building your kitchen. I was a bit miffed, but Don Mucho's really did make up for it. It was so cool. A bar, live music, fire dancers every night, and great food. It was packed with hippie travelers every night. The name, by the way, was the Morales children's nickname for their father Moises, Don Mucho, because he always wanted more. By early March, our house was complete, except for the roof. Chato's guys had weather-sealed it with black tar, but they hadn't painted it yet. It made our house so hot that the candles on our new kitchen table melted into piles of wax. I ended up bribing his crew chief, Marcelo to expedite the painting of our roof. There was no AC, just screened windows, so it was still super hot, just not deadly anymore. By now it was mid-March. Our new Topcon laser theodolite was supposed to be shipped to Alfonso's house, but it hadn't arrived yet. Jim and I had already lost too much field time, so we decided to just get started with the drawing phase. Again, our methodology was to map every section of the site twice. Once with graph paper, going quick with a pace and compass method. Then a second time with the laser theodolite. The drawings helped us plan effective places to set up the theodolite avoiding tree falls and looking for places where the machine could shoot in multiple buildings from a single station. Our season two goal was to map the western part of Palenque, from the tourist parking lot all the way out to the Pacota River and beyond if we could. For season one, we used the road to the ruins as our boundary marker. Now we would cross that into the deep forests of the west. We showed up at our usual 7 a.m. and met Manuel and Rogelio, who agreed to be our machete crew again. They had walked over the mountains from their village of Naranjo. The trek took them about two hours. Our workday always ended at 3 p.m. to give them enough time to walk home for dinner. In Naranjo, when the sun went down, the whole town went to sleep. Half the town was up again at 4 a.m., eating breakfast and preparing to walk, in the dark, over the mountains again. I swear, those Naranjo boys worked harder just getting to and from work than I worked all day. Mad respect for those guys. Just the field day was plenty hard enough for Jim and I. Especially near the road, the underbrush was hard to get through and full of snakes. Just in that first week, Manuel and Rogelio killed five Ferdelances, Nawiakas in their language. Another three escaped before they got the machete. We were quickly enthused by finding the western side of Group 4, but also disheartened. Group 4 was an elite residence of a war captain named Chak Zutz. It was only known on the east side of that modern road. But our survey discovered the road's construction had cut right through it. Its western half had luxury residences as well. Who knows what was where the road was now paved. In fact, there was a whole western half of Group J on the other side of that road, all the way to the next river, the Motiapa. We called that part Group J West. We mapped all that out to the Motiapa River and to the cliff where the Motiapa's waterfall dropped down into a beautiful place called Pakal's Pool. It was always full of skinny dipping hippies, but we just ignored them and kept mapping. Around Pakal's Pool, we found ancient courtyards and housing groups. Two buildings looked like they could have been sweat baths. We had found similar sweat baths along the Otulum River during Season 1 at the Queen's Bath, so more here made sense. Once we had mapped to where the mountain hit the plains in the south, we turned around and went back uphill. 
Starting on the edge of our new Group J West, we went north. But strangely, we found no buildings. A hundred meters, no buildings. At 100 meters, we found a two-meter terrace stretching out east and west for as far as the forest would let us see. We climbed it and went another 100 meters north on another flat, open space. Again, no buildings. But now we were at the base of a four-meter tall terrace with temples on top, and we had mapped that area the year before. We had just connected some major dots. We decided to do a quick reconnaissance of just how big those two flat open areas were. To our surprise, they were both about 100 by 100 meters in size. On all sides, they had densely clustered building groups. But these two pieces of prime Palenque real estate were totally empty. If Palenque had a central marketplace, I bet you that was it. On its east side, along the Motiapa River, we mapped in over 100 buildings in a section Franz Blom called Group E. The buildings were in good condition. Lots of standing walls and one building that Jim accessed from a hole in its roof. And it had two distinct rooms inside. Jim was always enthusiastically jumping into those holes. I didn't like it at all, so I was happy to let him do it. That first month of work was rough. Jim cut his hand with the machete, my arms were shredded by a tangle of thorny vines, and Manuel got stung in the face by a hive of wasps. The wasps were actually some of the worst things in the jungle. We all took multiple hits from them. Once I accidentally jammed one in my ear and couldn't get it out until we got back to the house that evening. The end of March brought Semana Santa, Easter week, and a mandatory holiday for all. Steve Seamer showed up to run the mapping database, and Jim took a short trip to San Cristobal. Mark Child and Zach Ruby showed up, making their way to their own project in the ruins of Piedras Negras. Showing off our new house and Don Mucho's, we had a party that lasted two days long. Over the three years of the project, all sorts of archaeology friends would stop in, it was fun, but usually exhausting due to all the mandatory parties. I mean, I had a responsibility to be a good host, didn't I? Just that first month, we had also hosted the crew from Caracol Belize and gave a tour to Joel Skidmore of Mesoweb.com. By the way, Mesoweb.com is an incredible resource for all sorts of info about ancient Mesoamerica. I'll put their website on my show notes for you. Well, okay, I'll take my last commercial break now. When I return, we'll talk about Moises' retreat and Alfonso's incredible discoveries in Temple 19. Your dogs aren't just pets. They're family. So treat them like it. I mean, literally treat them with positive cravings. My family's pets are so spoiled. We're always on the lookout for a new treat that they would like. My wife actually makes our dog and cat what she calls a bark tutory board every morning for breakfast. Positive Cravings offers the best single ingredient meat-based treats on the market at prices that don't break the bank. They have odor-free bully sticks, collagen sticks, long-lasting cheeky sticks, cow hooves, pig ears, and much more. Go to PositiveCravings.com for more information and use the code MAYA, M-A-Y-A, to get 10% off your order today. Tell them ArcheoEd sent you. Twenty twenty five is on the horizon, so it's time for my annual Mayan wall calendar. This year marks 17 years I've been producing this calendar. Back in 2007, I inherited it from a nice guy named Jeff Schoenard. He had been producing it for 20 years. He said, I've done my cartoon and it's time to hand the baton. I can't believe I'm approaching the completion of my own cartoon making this calendar. Anyhow, the 2025 Maya calendar looks great. 
As always, it features the winning photos from our annual photo contest. It's a regular wall calendar, but includes the Maya date for every day in 2025, plus important dates in ancient Maya history. It's available at my website, mayan-calendar.com. If you support ArcheoEd through Patreon at the Mayanist level, you get one for free. Proceeds go to support Maya Exploration Center. Get yours today and see time in a different way for 2025. Samana Santa came and went, but still no laser theodolite. By now, we had graph paper mapped right up to the Motiapa's eastern bank, and it was time to do round two with the laser mapping instrument. We ended up using Alfonso's old laser theodolite for two weeks. It had two batteries, each with about three hours of charge. If we could charge each up all night, we could get through most of a work day. It was slow going, but we got it done. The hardest part with the machine was the Motiapaz waterfall. It was about 20 meters tall and fell straight off a cliff. We found a good place to set up the tripod at the base of the waterfalls, and Jim scaled them in his tevas with the prism strapped to his back. He was underwater at the base and almost pushed off the top by rushing water. On the sides, he found little ledges to hang on to. As he did so, he found a wall tucked into the limestone curtains of the waterfall. It was one of many times that we found a place where the falls were covering architecture. Those things are lost to time. No one will ever cut into the falls to reveal them, but we always wondered what they were. We got caught up with the machine and it was time to cross the Motiapa. I beelined us to a group I was looking forward to seeing called Moisés's Retreat. It was big on Merle Green Robertson's map in the 1980s. Linda Sheely had given it the name Moisés's Retreat because Moy knew where it was since the 1950s. Moisés, who was now my neighbor in Panchan, told me that he used to go there when he was angry with the archaeologists back then. He would say to himself, they may know more than me, but they don't know about this place. Moisés's retreat did not disappoint. It was a whole complex of tall buildings with wide open courtyards and the Piedras Bolas River on its western side. At its center was a huge platform, 30 meters on a side and 4 meters tall. On the top and around that platform were small pyramid-shaped structures, likely funerary monuments with tombs inside. Blom had recorded two tombs in the area in the 1920s. We found them, and Jim jumped down into them. They were empty, but just as Blom had described 80 years earlier. Franz Blom is one of my historical heroes, so relocating those tombs felt like walking in his footsteps. But up on top of Moisés's retreat's platform, we found a hole that Blom had not found. Perhaps it wasn't even there in his time. Tree falls happen all the time and occasionally open up holes like this one. Of course, Jim jumped down in there immediately. He found himself in a hallway with stucco still on the walls. He dropped through a hole in its corbelled arch ceiling. He called up, It's a whole labyrinth down here. In a completely unhelpful fashion, I called back, be careful down there. Any snakes? The whole platform was actually a series of first-story rooms. He walked west to the end of the hall and found a room with columns and doorways leading out to the courtyard. From the outside, it was nothing but collapse. But from the inside, Jim understood what it was. It was the outside of a building. We decided we would wait for project reconstruction artist Heather Hurst to arrive to map out its interior. As we surveyed around the platform, we found lots of smaller residential compounds arranged in little courtyards. This was the third or fourth time we had seen this settlement pattern, and a light bulb went off over my head. Each residential section we had mapped had a noticeably bigger and nicer housing compound surrounded by smaller ones. 
These were probably lineage or clan neighborhoods with leading families living in the biggest compounds. Modern Maya neighborhoods in the Chiapas Highlands arrange themselves in the same pattern to this day. The wealthy families represent their neighborhoods, or SNAs, in city politics. My theory was, and still is, that Palenque was organized in a similar fashion. Now, I was the leader of the Palenque mapping project. The excavation project running at the same time was the PGC, the Proyecto Grupo de la Cruz, the Cross Group project. Alfonso Morales was the leader of that project. In archaeology speak, he was the principal investigator. My old friend Christopher Powell was the crew chief. They were excavating, for the first time ever, temples 19 and 20. Theirs was the sexy, important project. My crew and I were just weird guys in the woods. We were in the habit of checking with the excavations every Wednesday. Sometimes Alfonso had some architectural mapping work for us to do. They had found an amazing carved bench in Temple 19. On its front face, it showed King Akal Monab III sitting on a bench just like the bench that it was carved on in a council of six important-looking lords. On the side was another carved panel, this one talking about Palenque's mythological first rulers, the Palenque Triad. Its text told us for the first time about their father and how he lived during the third creation of the world. That was an incredible find, but then they made an even bigger one, a tomb in the top of Temple 20. They hit the tomb from above, so they poked a small hole in its roof and lowered a video camera down for a look. That weekend, we had a party to watch the video. We could see the pottery and jades around where a body should have been, but there were no bones. We learned later that the bones were just hidden under stucco that fell from the roof. The showstoppers were the walls. As the camera panned, we could see painted figures all walking the same direction with scepters in their hands. There were nine figures total, all richly dressed men. That same scene, with nine scepter-carrying men processing around the tomb walls, appears in Pakal's tomb underneath the Temple of Inscriptions. That made this individual surely related to Pakal in some manner. It was amazing to be among the first people to see it in over a thousand years. The next Wednesday we rolled up to see their progress to find half the crew sitting on logs in front of Temple 19. The president of Mexico, Ernesto Zedillo at that time, was up in the temple to see the bench. Also there were the governor of Chiapas, the heads of Ina, Palenque staff, and the press. The gringo project members were asked politely to leave. We understood. Gringos discovering Mexican patrimony was a bad look for the president. We all agreed that we were just happy to be there. Jim and I took our places on the log and enjoyed the show. On the next Friday, our new laser theodolite was delivered. Jim, Steve, and I spent the whole weekend learning how to use it and testing it against the old theodolite to make sure they were producing identical results. On Monday... We were excited to bring it out into the field. First, we purposely ran a loop that allowed us to tag a machine station that we had established in Season 1. The error was just 13 centimeters, which was great. That meant our map was still accurate to less than the width of a single building block. Then we got started on shooting in the points of Moises' retreat. The machine was working great. It was way faster than the old one, and lighter too. It almost doubled the pace we were able to map at. On our lunch break, we heard the noise of falling rocks from a nearby group of ruins. We walked over there to find the corner of a building with large flat stones that had just been removed, but no signs of who was doing it. The next day we heard it again and snuck carefully over there. This time, we saw one of the guards of the ruins quickly walking away and also more fresh damage. 
That evening I told Alfonso about it, apparently a guard looting the site. Alfonso set up a watcher the next day, and with a sting operation he caught him. And to his delight, it was a guard who was always giving him a hard time during the excavations. He was collecting stones to repair pathways in the site center, but that was strictly forbidden. His bosses pinned it on him and fired him. Alfonso was pleased with the result, and Moises' retreat was protected. With that nonsense done, we surveyed downhill from Moises' retreat. There we encountered a small cacao tree grove, the trees where chocolate come from. A couple of Lock and Doan Maya were there picking cacao pods, sporting their typical long hair and white robes. I recognized them as the Lock and Doan that ran a souvenir stand in the ruins parking lot. We chatted for a bit, and then we got back to mapping. At first they seemed nervous that I was going to give them a hard time, but I said cacao is a renewable resource, and it was, after all, their forest. They filled up their net bag and headed back to the parking lot, about a half a kilometer from there. Over beers at Don Mucho's that night, Jim and I mused over the experience. Here we were, thinking we were discovering unknown parts of Palenque, but the Lock and Doan already knew about it. It was just one more example of Westerners thinking they had discovered something new, only to find the Maya had never forgotten it. Okay, that's a wrap for part four of Palenque Mapping Project episodes. If you liked it, I'll do part five next month. If you didn't, I'll do something else. In any event, this is Ed, a.k.a. ArcheoEd, signing off. You've been listening to ArcheoEd, a podcast about the ancient civilizations of the Americas. If you like what you heard, please click like, subscribe, and tell your friends. If you didn't, don't do any of that stuff. ArcheoEd is written, recorded, and produced by me, Ed Barnhart, and it's owned by my company, Ancient Explorations, LLC. ArcheoEd is my intellectual property, all rights reserved. Copyright 2024.